it, Philippians 2. We went through the book of Philippians last year, so it must have been a, a while ago. Philippians chapter 2 is where I'm asking you to turn tonight. And while you're turning there, I just want to I just want to mention how we normally think. We human beings, you know what we think? We think that people that rule over other people, they they have the power. Well, that's natural human thinking. But when Jesus informs his disciples that he is about to go to Jerusalem, he's going to suffer, he's going to die, they didn't like that. No, you're the Messiah. That's not supposed to happen to you. You're supposed to rule with power. Don't talk about suffering. He got major pushback. And Peter verbalized it for the group. And when Peter said what he did, Lord, this is not going to happen to you. Jesus pushed back and rebuked Peter for talking like that. And uh, Jesus says to Peter, basically, he said, get out of the way. You're a, you're, you're a roadblock to the will of God. You're a, you're a stumbling block. To, to me doing God's will. And then he says, and this is King James uh, English, you don't savor the things that belong to God, but you savor the things that, are, that belong to men. And savorest is the word that the scripture uses there. Is it's you, your thinking. Your thinking is human. It's not divine. It's not God's way of thinking. It's man's way of thinking. That's what Jesus, and Jesus, he basically tells the disciples, not only there, but on other occasions, God's way of thinking is that power comes through submission. That power comes through yielding. Now, that doesn't sound right in human thinking. And, you know, you can force people to submit. There are strict regimes all over this planet. You can go to countries and you have to submit. But in their hearts, people are rebelling. But outwardly, they're submitting because they're fearful of what will happen to them if they don't. So you can force people to submit. But inwardly, they're not. They're, they're rebelling. Do you realize that without submission, no human relationship will ever work. No human relationship will ever work, will ever last. If there is not a mutual submission, for example, between a husband and a wife, the marriage won't last. One of the two, preferably both of them, but one of the two at least has to submit to the other or it's not going to work. Interestingly, before that, that, uh, that uh, section in Ephesians 5, where Paul talks about husbands, love your wives, wives submit to you. Before he gets into that, just a verse before that, in verse 21, he says to the whole church, submit yourselves one to another. You're not talking necessarily about husband and wife, but he's talking about believers in general. We are to submit ourselves one to another because submission... Submission is what makes relationships work. Now, how do you do that? Because I don't like to submit. Do you? Human beings naturally do not like to submit. And we think that submitting uh, says I'm weak and that person's stronger than me if I have to submit to that person. Well, I've had you turn to Philippians chapter 2, and uh, this is what Paul is talking about here. And he says in verse 2, Fulfill my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, 
Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. He's talking about, you know, there's a problem in this church. There was strife between some in this church, which is common in local churches. People don't always get along. There's strife sometimes. There's strife here in this church at Philippi. And so Paul's dealing with that. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. That's pride, arrogance but rather in lowliness of mind. I'm reading verse 3 in your Bible. In lowliness of mind, or thinking, thinking lowly of yourself. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem or value the other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things. Stop looking out for yourselves, but rather look on the things of others. Start caring and looking on the things of others. Verse 5, here's the key verse. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How does submission to one another work in relationships? What is needed in order to make that happen? I think verse 5 is the answer to that question. You and I must have the mind of Christ. Well, do you know that we have the mind of Christ if we're believers? We have a spiritual mind. We have the mind of Christ, but often we don't tap into it. Often we ignore the mind of Christ or we we push it away when the Spirit of God, the mind of Christ in us. Literally what he's saying in verse in verse 5 is, be God-minded. Be God-minded. Think like God thinks. Think like Jesus thinks. It's the same word that Paul used, or, or, or rather that Jesus used, when he rebuked Peter and said, you're thinking like man thinks. You're not thinking like God thinks. And Paul is saying, think like God thinks. Submission, a willing submission, willingly, to another person isn't natural. It's, it takes us back really to the Garden of Eden. You know, I was thinking about it one night because when I was uh, trying to go to sleep, I was thinking about it. I was thinking, you know, Lord, you really have me preach on the self-life a lot. I'll bet people get sick of hearing that. I'm always talking about dealing with your self-centeredness, your self-interest, the self-life in you. And and the Spirit of God just spoke to my heart and said, well, that's your problem. You shouldn't worry about how much you speak about that. When you do, you're worried about yourself. Right. And he and then he reminded me. Our self-centeredness, our selfishness, our self-interest is really the root of all sin. It was Eve's interest in herself, which was, of course, picked by the tempter in that garden. But it was her interest in herself that caused her to disobey God's command. It was Adam's interest in himself that caused him to be a cohort with his wife and disobey God's one command. So the self-interest, self-centeredness is really the the root of all sin. So it's right to harp on it. (laughs) It's right to always speak about it because It's our self-interest that leads us into sin. That really came home to me that night as I was thinking about it. And Dad takes us back to the garden. There's a rivalry here in the church in uh, Philippi. There's a couple of ladies that aren't getting along, we find in chapter 4, for example. In uh, verse 15, <clears throat> he, he says, uh, 
in, in chapter 1 and verse 15. He says, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife and also some of goodwill. One preached Christ of contention, not sincerely. There, there's problems here. And um, carnality really is at the, it's just human thinking. It's carnal thinking, absolute carnal thinking. These Christians had different mindsets. That's why he says in verse 2 of chapter 2, be like-minded. Be of one mind. You're thinking selfishly is basically what he's saying. You need a new mind. You need a new way of thinking. You need to be God-minded. You need to have the mind of Jesus, the mind of Christ. Each person is selfishly thinking their own way. And the only solution is that they have a change of thinking. You know, he says in another passage, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed, be completely metamorphosized like a caterpillar becomes a beautiful butterfly, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need renewed minds, minds that have been renewed from a human way of thinking, a natural selfish way of thinking, to a new spiritual Jesus way of thinking. Need to be of one mind. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. We need to think like Jesus. That's the solution. There are several characteristics in this second chapter that I quickly want to touch on that I think characterizes Jesus's way of thinking or God's way of thinking. And that needs to be the way we think. Verse 3. He says, let nothing be done through strife, through strife. When we have strife with other people or with our circumstances, it may not involve other people, but when we have strife, it's because we're focusing on ourselves. And so the first characteristic, I would say, of being God-minded, having the mind of Christ, having thinking like Jesus thinks, is a selflessness. I remember the Lord made this verse so clear to me when I was working in a beef processing plant when I was in seminary. And I hated the job that they would give me often because it was, you know, I wanted to be at the at the butcher block, you know, cutting meat, but I didn't have that skill set. So they had me doing, you know, just the, the worst job in the whole butcher shop. And uh, I remember thinking, uh, uh, you know, grumbling in my heart when I was working. And the Holy Spirit of God, I had been memorizing the book of Philippians. The Holy Spirit of God brought that verse to my attention when I was grumbling in my heart. <clears throat> I even grumbled to my boss, who was a Christian. And he, and he, I remember him, he said, well, Jim, he said, you know, in the army, you get paid the same amount for marching as you do for fighting. Okay, I got it, I get it. And then, the, But that, that didn't solve it, but the Holy Spirit solved it because he said, let nothing be done through strife. And I was filled with strife because I was feeling sorry for myself because I had the nasty job and everyone had a better job than me. And so the mind of Christ is selflessness, self-interest, self-centeredness self is the main characteristic of a natural man of a person that Christ is not the center of their life, but you are the center of your life. It's that kind of attitude. What's in it for me? 
If I do this, what am I going to get out of it? How am I going to benefit from this? And that distorted orientation of thinking has to be, it has to be corrected. It has to be undone. That kind of an attitude. God wants to turn our focus from ourselves to him first and then to others. That's basically what he's saying here in this chapter. To get your eyes off of yourself, to stop focusing on self. You'll it, stop striving to get something for yourself is what he's saying. Greater love, I think we, we saw this last week in John 15, hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. That's a selflessness. The biggest problem that you face is staring you in the mirror when you look into it. It's yourself. And all that comes with a self-centeredness a selfishness. So the first characteristic of having the mind of Christ, thinking like Jesus thinks, is selflessness. Here's the second one. Verse 3 again. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Vainglory is conceitedness. It's pride and arrogance. So the second characteristic of thinking like Jesus is not only a selflessness, but a humbleness, a humbleness where you're unconcerned with doing things so people see you. You're unconcerned with doing things for appearance sake so that you can elevate yourself personally, whether so you can feel good about yourself or have other people say good things about you. Jesus did the will of the Father, and he cared nothing about what people thought about him or how people viewed him or his ministry. In fact, he emptied himself, and he took upon himself willingly the reputation of a, an unimportant slave. Humbleness. Humbleness is the characteristic of thinking like Jesus thinks. You know, and I have to always remind myself of this. It doesn't matter what people think about me. What ought to concern me is what people think about my Savior. That's what concerns me. That's the way Jesus thinks. There's a third characteristic of having a God-mindedness. Think like Jesus, the mind of Christ. Drop down to verse 14 in this same second chapter. He says, do all things without murmurings. That's griping. That's complaining. You know, when we murmur, when we gripe, when we complain, you know what that is? That's self-pity. That's an attitude of pitying ourselves. That's an aspect of, of self-centeredness, too. We're pitying poor me. I deserve better treatment than this. I deserve a better job than this. I deserve this and not... And we're told that all the time. In all the commercials, uh, they always seem to throw that in. You know, you deserve this. You know what you really deserve. <laughs> Thank God we don't get our true desserts, our just desserts as believers, because Jesus took those what we deserve for us already. And so I would say that the third characteristic of thinking like Jesus, having the mind of Christ, is an attitude of unworthiness, of unworthiness. Jesus said, you know, when a servant comes in from the field, uh, uh, he, the, the master 
doesn't invite him to sit down and have, he says, you know, no, you served me first. And when you've served your master, you're still an unworthy and unprofitable, you're, you're an unworthy servant, right? Our unworthiness is when we think we're worthy that we murmur, that we complain. It reminds me of that uh, woman missionary. She was a highly trained medical doctor. She had two uh, degrees from the top medical schools in, um, in England. And God sent her as a missionary to Africa to be a surgeon. And she was. And she was an excellent surgeon. But she had to do very menial tasks at times. And one time she had to learn how to make brick from mud and uh, bake them in the sun and then break them apart. She showed the natives how to do this. And in doing it, she realized when she was uh, working with this hardened, uh, these bricks, that her fingers were bleeding. And she said, these are the hands of a surgeon. They shouldn't be having to handle this menial and uh, rough brick. This isn't the task for a surgeon. And God, in, in, in her heart, said, Helen, I didn't send you here to be a surgeon. I sent you here to be a servant. And then later on, one of the natives said, when we see you working and your hands bleeding like ours do, we see you love us. When you're doing surgery, you're fearful. We fear you, but when you're working with bloody hands like us, then we know you love us. You know what? you and I deserve. We deserve an opportunity to show the world, to show people the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we deserve. And you can't do that if you think you're not getting what you deserve. So unworthiness is the way Jesus thinks. Humbleness is the way Jesus thinks. And selflessness is the way Jesus thinks. Fourth and final thing, <clears throat> in verse 14 again, mm -hmm. he says, do all things without murmurings and without disputings. What's disputings? Arguing. Having fights. Could be verbal. In other words, when you think like Jesus thinks, you not only think humbly and that you're unworthy and selflessly, but also there's an agreeableness about you. Instead of disputing, you can't bargain with God. God doesn't make deals with you. You can't compromise with God. You either obey him or you don't. There's no such thing as partial obedience. In fact, <clears throat> you compromise the will of God if you place any condition on it at all. You can't say, Lord, I will serve you in any way at any time except <laughs> that won't fly. No disputings. The mind of Christ, the way God thinks, is a total agreeableness. Lord, whatever, whatever, it's okay with me. It's all right. There's an agreeableness. Why is the mind of Christ so, that's what it is, those four characteristics. But why is it important? Because God's transforming power cannot be exerted through any other life except a self-sacrificing one. That's the only way it'll happen. 
God has to get us who are naturally self-centered, self-interested. He's got to get us to care more about others than we care for ourselves. And that takes time. And that takes work on God's part. That we care more about him than we care about ourselves. That's true love. And that's what he's working to accomplish in you. It's, it's Moses saying, Lord, you can blot me out of the book. Just save Israel. Or it's Paul saying, Lord, I could wish myself accursed for the Jewish people if that would bring them your salvation. The only hope for spiritual success in your relationships with anyone is that you have Jesus's thinking, you have his way of thinking, and if you don't, you, you cover, you shroud the light of the gospel by being self-centered, and you choke the life-giving word by self-centered living, verse 15, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked, perverse nation, whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. You shroud the light. You choke the life by self-centered living. How can you and I come to care more about others than ourselves? Well, not by struggling to, to, uh, to do it. Not by imitating Jesus. But the only way to get this self-interest, this self-centered living, is to put it to death. You rid it by putting it to death. You recognize the fact that, you know what? That old self-centered person that I used to be died with Christ. The old self is dead. That's the fact. And I want that fact to be functional. I want that to be operational in my daily life. I want to live a crucified life. I want to live a life that is self-sacrificing and not self-centered. And the way that's possible is in the verses just up above that, verses 12, uh, I think it is, and 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Here's how it's accomplished. How do you have the mind of Christ? It is God that works in you, both to will. God gives you a will, a desire to think like Jesus. Do you have that? Do you want to be self-centered? Or do you want to be Christ-centered? Do you have a desire to live for yourself or do you have a desire to live for Jesus? You see, if I have a desire or you have a desire to, to not be self-centered but to live for Jesus, we didn't come up with that. It's the Spirit of God works that desire in me and you. So if you have any desire in that direction at all, God put it in you but he put it in you so that it'd become a reality through you. Because it goes on to say, he works in you not only to have the desire, the will, but also to give you the power, to give you the ability to do it, his good pleasure. God will give you both the desire to be self-sacrificing and not self-centered, and God will give you the ability, the power, the grace, the strength to not be, live a self-centered life, but a self-sacrificing life. Stop thinking about yourself all the time. Stop talking about yourself all the time. Even in your, your talk, your spiritual talk about your life with the Lord, stop talking about yourself all the time. 
Start focusing on him. I don't want to put a I don't want to put a, a monkey wrench into testimonies, but this is it takes grace. It it takes supernatural ability to think different and then to live different. It occurs as you allow the spirit of God in you to stir up the desire. And then you cooperate with him and say, okay, God, you've given me the desire. Now enable me to work it out. Enable me to live it. A, a, a unselfish, a selfless life, a humble life, a life that recognizes I'm unworthy and an agreeable life. Lord, it's okay with me. You call the shots. Whatever. It's all right with me. So God uses your relationships with people to peel back those layers like an onion of the self life to reveal Christ at the center. You know, I work with a, a man that is, he's a believer. I haven't asked him this, but I was really, I was all, right on the verge of asking this today when I was working with him. I wanted to ask him, do you know second Peter 3.18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because you sure have a head full of knowledge, but have you grown in grace in proportion? Because he's always complaining. And I've been there. I admitted that. He's always complaining about he work when he has to work with this unsaved man that he's a tough one to work with. I, I get it. But I said to him, don't you realize, have you ever thought about the fact that it's not an accident that you're working with this guy, that God puts you with him? You know, God puts saved people in unsaved families and that saved person is to be a sanctifying factor in the relationships in that family. And God puts you with this person so that you can have a sanctifying effect upon him. So that you can impact him for the Lord. Don't think about what he's doing to you. Think about God has a purpose for me to be a sanctifying influence in this man's life. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Be a Jesus thinker. Think like God.